your source for everything paranormal. Para-X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. Now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Hey, Mary Meet everybody, and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron here on the Para-X Radio Network. The intro music tonight was called Victorian London, and that's where we'll be verbally visiting tonight with my guest, author John Matthews. John has made a lifetime study of the legends of King Arthur, the Celtic traditions, and is the author of more than 100 books, including Taliesin, The Last Celtic Shaman, The Grail, Quest for Eternal Life, the award-winning Arthur of Albion, and the New York Times bestseller, Pirates. He's acted as an advisor on several big-budget movies, including King Arthur, and tonight we're going to be talking about his book, The Mystery of spring Jack. Now, Jack is an unsolved mystery from the Victorian era, a fascinating entity in English folklore, and I can't wait to get started. So, John, welcome, and thank you for joining me tonight. Hi there, Marla. Glad to be there. Ah, Spring Hill Jack. Um, I don't even know where to begin, but there are so many theories about the nature and identity of him. Uh, Could you give us just a little bit of background on this odd character? Sure. Well, I mean, he is, as you say, very various, and, and there's a lot of material about him. Um, he first uh, literally springs to our attention in 1838, um, when you get start getting sightings in and around the east end of London. So from around February 1838, reports began to happen in newspapers um, around the city, saying, uh, describing this curious character who had leapt out and attacked people, not seriously, but just leapt out, frightened them, and then vanished again, always with this extraordinary agility. And um, so what became really a a kind of wide search began uh, among the authorities um, to try and find out who he was, what he wanted, where he came from, that kind of thing. Um, And uh, no one ever really found out. It became a complete mystery. (laughs) Well, it was probably difficult to kind of figure him out because he was described by people in a variety of ways. I mean, some people claim to have seen him as a terrifying, frightful, and otherworldly thing with clawed hands, bat wings, and eyes that resembled red balls of fire, which I think is very colorful. Um, it, is but they, huh? <laughs> it is indeed, yes. There are a lot of people saw him in that way. Yeah, Isn't and they are. Sorry, they also claimed that he could breathe out blue and white flames. And others, though, said he was tall and thin with the appearance of a gentleman. 
And uh, at least two people claimed that he was able to speak comprehensible English. So, you know, but at the same time, he was often referred to as a demon, a ghost, a nobleman in disguise, a supernatural creature who could turn into a man at will. I mean, what a controversial character, to say the least, isn't he? Absolutely is. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book, because I'd been I'd come across this character several times uh, in researches into other uh, similar kind of figures. And um, no, it was very clear that no one really had an answer and that no one had really sat down and gathered all the materials to, uh, you know, to try and find out who he was. And well, I mean, shall I tell you now? I didn't find out who he was. I forgot some theories. <laughs> but the mystery remains unbroken, but it's a very interesting journey. It is. Now, you know, this urban legend was very popular in its time due to tales of his, you know, appearance and his ability to make extraordinary leaps, hence the spring heel part. Um, but it's it, it, he was so talked about to the point that he became topic of several works of fiction. Now, do you believe that all urban legends come urban legends come from some sort of fact that becomes greatly exaggerated rather I, than being completely fabricated? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I mean, you know, today you've got, you know, these characters like um the Mothman and uh, uh several characters of that kind, mm -hmm. the Phantom and others. Um and there always seems to be a, a grain of something in there. You know, they don't just happen because somebody decided to make something up. It usually mm -hmm. comes from a sighting of some kind. And in the first few months within that, within those first, uh, with that first sighting in, in February 1838, um, you know, as many as 50 sightings were recorded. And they mm -hmm. all, they were all very similar, which is interesting. So you have to ask yourself, were all those people just copying each other, or was there, in fact, something going on? Like a mass hysteria, perhaps, too. But I think part of the thing was, I, I mean, I was reading where in the early 19th century, there were reports of ghosts that stalked the streets of London. And they were described as pale. They were believed that they stalked and preyed on lone predators. And the stories told these figures were... Um, happening in London and and it was a kind of a distinct ghost tradition that kind of formed from there um and maybe some are some writers argue that maybe that formed the foundation of the later legend of Spring Hill Jack so let's talk a little bit about Victorian England at the time of the sightings because this was said to have been the era of oddities. There were some very popular customs like, you know, Victorian post-mortem photography and freak right. shows and, and the like. So what, what, was, what was it like back then? Well, I mean, they were incredibly curious. You, you have to remember that this is the first time that, you know, the ordinary man in the street had enough leisure time uh, to actually spend looking into things. Mm -hmm. um, and they were very curious. I mean, you've got these... Um, these extraordinary stories that, that go around. Spring Hill Jack's only one. Jack the Ripper, of course, was not a fiction by any means. Right. Um, and a lot of these things overlapped with each other. You were getting people seeing strange lights in the sky, which uh, some people have, of course, interpreted as being UFOs uh, mm -hmm. before, before the idea of UFOs were around. Ghosts were very popular. Um, there were a lot of, there was a lot into, people were into mediumship. Mm -hmm. um, there were all these things going on at the same time, and, and it seemed as though there was an enormous thirst for this strange idea, so this, for the paranormal, basically. It's where it all begins to get really noticeable, if you like, mm -hmm. right about this time. Um, because, there's, as I say, the ordinary people had time and money to spend on going to see shows. They would buy these penny dreadful magazines that were sold on street corners, literally for a penny which had sensational, wild stories in them. Um, there, were just, there was just a big, uh, a big hunger for all of that. There was a lot of fuel for the fire going on right then. And, and I think, you know, once you light the match, things start burning, I think. And, and not badly, not in a bad way. I mean, it, this is kind of a fascinating thing. But when did you first hear about Jack? Did you grow up with a legend because... I understand that mothers were scaring their children to keep them in order by threatening no. them with him or something. 
I'm glad to say no. I never. I, my mother never never brought that one uh, to bear <laughs> on me. Um, no, I, I discovered it actually in a strange roundabout way because I was looking into fairy law, which is one of my interests also. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I found, started find, finding these folklore accounts of strange uh, beings that didn't, to me, sound like the traditional fairies of folklore tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, and I started looking at some of them, and then I kept coming across this one about spring Jack. And it's, several things struck me right away about this. One was that he never killed anybody. He was never, mm-hmm. he was never guilty of murder. Um, he attacked women a lot, but never raped anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, there was something odd about him. It was though he was, um, you know, as elusive a character as, as you could possibly get. And, and then I was reading about the later Jack the Ripper, and I found that in one of his letters, uh, you know, because he wrote these letters to the policeman who was investigating the murders, mm-hmm. or at least someone wrote a letter anyway, and in one of them he actually signs himself spring Jack. Yes. <laughs> so that's back, as they say, you know, and I mean, it's like even if even an actual, you know, well-known murderer actually starts claiming to be spring heel Jack, that means it's very deep in the consciousness. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, uh, spring heel Jack's modus operandi was to shock and frighten people rather than killing them. Hmm. Um, and and to me, he he just seemed to be, I don't know, a prankster. Um, somebody that needed some, somebody, something, some entity that <laughs> needed attention, um, for whatever reason, because he really did no harm. Um, and I, you know, it's just funny that Jack the Ripper decided to use his as a signature at some point, maybe to lessen his guilt. Nah, he had no guilt. Never mind. Oh. Um, <laughs> it was just interesting <laughs> that, yeah, as you said, that he was so popular that, that people were, you know, pretending to be him or signing his name. But, you know, it's the, it's the way it grew that's so interesting because you've got, you know, you go, I mean, uh, by the way, incidentally, since I wrote the book, um, a friend of mine um, who has been doing some research has discovered some earlier references from the end of the 18th century. Huh. So going even further back, they're not exactly the same, but they do have this same quality of the mysterious person who leaps out from behind a fence or over a wall frightens someone and then disappears but it's really from the 19th century period that things got very busy and to begin with the first few reports you know there was there was one about an attack on clergyman's daughter in Brentford there was a a Miss Dixon was attacked Um, various other people were, were reported having seen or experienced this and to begin with um, most of the people would write back to the newspaper because everyone wrote into the newspapers in those days saying, how, ro- how ridiculous, this is rubbish, nonsense, we should ignore it. But gradually, as the, the accounts began to be more and more, people started saying, well, then, then it should be looked into. And we only had a very kind of very early and rather primitive police force at that point. So in many cases, it was vigilantes and private groups who went in search of him. And, you know, b- b- uh, groups of people could be seen, you know, running through the streets of London with clubs and lanterns looking for sightings of spring Jack. They took <laughs> play, you know, so. Yeah, I, could, I just got a metal picture when you said that. And it was kind of funny because I could see Jack on a rooftop just springing from one to the other laughing hysterically. Well, that's kind of how he was, how he, how he appeared to, to behave a lot of the time. I mean, What's so interesting is that some of the reports that you get, particularly when people started to take it more seriously, um, they started to interview the people who'd seen him. And a lot of them were women. In fact, most of them were women. And so they were the usual sexist sort of remarks about women are hysterical. Of course, it's not real. But the the accounts are detailed. You know, they know they, they describe him. And as you said, they sometimes described him rather bizarrely as having, you know, blue fire coming out of his mouth and red, red eyes and very traditional, almost devil-like appearance. Um, but there was something very detailed about it. Yeah, um, well, you, you know, you, sorry, um, you've, you've mentioned the, the newspaper accounts and you've got quite a few of them in the book. You share original newspaper accounts of his encounters. Um, and I'm pretty much every one, in fact. Well, yes, <laughs> you're right. 
<laughs> and I'm particularly fond of the ones like this, and I'm quoting, all right? It mm -hmm. says, as they approached an angle in the passage, she came upon the person who was enveloped in a large cloak. He spurted a quality of blue flame right into her face, which deprived her of sight and so alarmed her that she instantly dropped to the ground and was enveloped with violent fits, which continued for several hours. Um, <laughs> it was, yeah. it, you know, it was really interesting to read all of those. It, first of all, it's interesting in what they had to say, the reports. Secondly, though, the, the second layer to that is it takes the reader back in time. And I really enjoyed that part of it, because as you're reading, you are there in a sense. So that yep. was that's lovely to have all those articles in there, truly. Well, thank you. I mean, that's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to have it told the story told as much as possible in the words <clears throat> of the people who'd either seen him or reported seeing him or indeed you'd investigated. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of the courtroom stuff as well. People are arrested and tried and there's the interviews that are going on in court. And I put as much of that in as I could. There is quite a bit more, but I put everything in that I could fit. Because right. that way, you really get that sense of, well, as you said, you're stepping back to the time, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're time traveling. Absolutely. And we don't need a TARDIS to do that by reading no. your book, which is very good. <laughs> um, now, Jack was also tied into other dastardly characters. Um, the Slender Man being one, correct? Um, in more recent times, yes. yes. Uh, yes. I mean, I... I looked at a lot of the di these different characters that have come along. Um, you know, for instance, in Baltimore, there was someone called the Phantom, who was seen leaping over buildings. Um, there, there have been characters in Britain. There's one cited in, in Houston, Texas, in 1953. And then you've got Mothman, which also mm -hmm. has that same quality of someone appearing and disappearing. And then right up to the present with the Slender Man, um, which is interesting because there you have a character who was literally invented yeah, by yeah. Uh, someone who was writing a games manual, and it took off a life of its own. Yes. So it, that's really interesting, isn't it? It is. And I mean, the Slender Man is, is very scary and, and quite dangerous. I mean, people have gotten into big trouble. Um, yeah. Either portraying it's him or believing in him or, or trying to call him because... You know, if you want to get a little metaphysical about this, if you create a thought form, you could have it pop up. Well, and, that would be yeah. possible. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, the girl, one, you know, there was the, the, the two girls who killed their friend because they said, yes. um, you know, Slender Man had told them to. So, yeah. you know, I mean, it's not exactly the same. Uh, and in, no. in some ways, it's, it's much nastier, of course, because as I say, <laughs> as far as we know, Jack never killed anybody. Right. But it, if, it, if it's coming from anywhere at that point, it's certainly in the Victorian period, it's it's coming out of a long line of people called Jack. Mm -hmm. now, we've all heard Jack and the Beanstalk, you know. Uh, we've heard these stories of the clever, clever Jack and foolish Jack. These are all folklore characters. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the ones who always get the better of the baddies. And they're the ones who always kill the giant or whatever. <laughs> and they also have associations with fairy rape people as well. Um, so, in a way, there's a long lineage of strange, slightly bizarre, slightly creepy, uh, clever, trickery kind of characters, all called Jack. Mm -hmm. I, think there's, I think there are connections there. Yeah, and well, I also read that he's also linked to a variety of characters like Robin Hood, Punch and Judy, and the Green Man. Now, to me, all those characters are very different from one another. So, what is the common denominator there, if there is one? Well, it's really the tricky. It's the, the trickster aspect because okay. the most the most clear thing about Springhill Jack is that he is, if nothing else, a trickster. Yeah. He likes to frighten people. He likes to play games. He likes to leap away just out of reach and to be just to be chased, but then to disappear. These are all the kind of actions of a of a trickster. And he would leap up outside windows and frighten people in the houses. Very much mm -hmm. trick tricksterish behaviour. Now. Robin Hood isn't exactly a trickster, but he fits into the, the bracket, as does the Green Man, as do um, uh, various other fairy characters. Um, this, this, this attitude of playing tricks on people all the time. I mean, Robin Hood plays tricks on the Sheriff of Nottingham and on his, uh, the, you know, the monks who he was stood against. Right. Um, 
and uh, you know you get you get this reappearing again and again. So I just think that if you look at the folklore, mm -hmm. um, particularly the old British folklore, anyway, then you do start to see certain parallels. Other people assumed he was the devil. You know, oh. again, he had horns, so of course he was the devil. <laughs> <laughs> well, and bat wings. I mean, the devil has been depicted as having bat wings, and I'm not sure about the metal claws, but you know. Certainly, the devil must have claws. It's of oh, some cool. sort. So, yeah. <laughs> now we just have to go see if Jack had a long tail with a pitchfork. Anyway. Well, um, sometimes he was <laughs> represented as that. But, of course, was... by that time, everyone had gone crazy and was, you know, picturing him in all kinds of different ways. And um, I'm pretty sure that I, I don't know this, but I'm fairly sure that the guy who invented Batman knew of him. <laughs> I think you know, a lot of people. Big parallel. <laughs> I think a lot of people knew him um, because I was looking, I'm trying to find my notes, um, even today, um, today's well-known authors have written about him. I didn't know this, and I'm, I've read lots and lots of Stephen King books over the years, but I found out that Stephen King wrote a short story years ago called Strawberry Spring, um, where an unnamed narrator sees the word spring Heel Jack, or the word spring Heel Jack in a newspaper. And it rekindles memories a few years before when during a strawberry spring, which is a false spring like an Indian summer. Mm -hmm. um, but it arrives with a thick fog that covered a college campus at night. So it provided the perfect cover for a serial killer called spring Heel Jack. Uh -huh. So, you know, Jack has managed to stay relevant in pop culture. Um, I had not heard of him before, or if I did, it was, you know, in passing. But the minute I saw this thing about Stephen King, I'm like, holy wow, you know, uh, for for the most well-known, one of the most well-known authors of the day to have known yeah. about him and written about him was kind of wonderful. Well, I missed that story myself. I shall go and look it up now. Um, I do. You now you've told me, I think I may have read it, but I'd forgotten about it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. interesting that these things keep on happening, you know. I mean, they're not, I guess they're not so well known in the States as they are here, but there are all these more recent appearances, as I mentioned, Houston, Baltimore, uh, Provincetown, Cape Cod, um, all these all these places had these characters. Um, and the interesting thing is that when you got a story like that, let's take, for instance, the Phantom. Um, mm -hmm. This is a character who's seen jumping from rooftop to rooftop, and he was witnessed by several as it were, very sound citizens, you know, not, they weren't drunk, you know, they weren't mad, they were, they were ordinary people. But the interesting thing is that almost immediately someone said, must have been Spring Hill Jack. <laughs> so he must have been known about, and he must have been in the consciousness of, of people, you know, even, as, as I say, as recently as um, the 50s. Uh -huh. So, you know, it's, it keeps coming up. Well, I also saw somewhere that they said there are, you know, 20th and 21st century uh, reports of Jack sightings. And and he seems to be on the move uh, because they continue to be having sightings in both England and now in the United States um, and perhaps in other places around the globe as well. So let's just take the assumption that this entity is a true entity. Hmm. And he's been around for couple hundred years now and never been caught and if you think about it along those lines that's kind of scary because he's ageless well entities don't always have a, a expiration date <clears throat> excuse me um so if if you do really believe that this is a possibility um it is just a little bit disconcerting on the one hand but very interesting on the other that this is somebody who's been around for centuries and you know, like the Energizer Bunny keeps going and going and going. It doesn't run out of batteries. Well, it seems that way, doesn't it? I mean, uh, you're quite right that there are still reports of this kind. In fact, um, a, a, a friend of mine was actually driving home from London um, into Oxfordshire, where I live, um, last year. And they were going down this dark road. And, you know, suddenly they saw this figure running across the road far too fast to be normal human being mm -hmm. and he went kind of went off to one side of the road and jumped over a high fence and vanished ah. so you know if that isn't a spring heel jack sighting i don't know what is <laughs> and um, if 
Yeah, and and spirit does the same thing. I mean, ghost sightings, they they can leap tall bounds. They're Superman. Um, So, you know, it could have been, it's interesting that it could have been any number of things, but that spring Hill Jack came to mind. I like that, you know? It seems to be, a, it's in the, it's in the psyche. It's in somewhere in the human psyche. And a lot of people that I've talked to, if you say, have you heard of Spring Hill Jack? They'll say, hmm, rings a bell. They might not remember, mm-hmm. they might not be able to tell you a single story about it, but they've heard the name. Yeah. Um, and I think that is, that is something that does say something about the way in which these very powerful archetypes will show up again and again. I mean, I'm, I'm fairly sure that there were some real people involved. And that there was some copycat stuff going on. I mean, there yeah. was yeah. there was an example of a uh, a guy called James Painter um, who literally dressed up as Jack according to the descriptions, and he was mm-hmm. caught. And it became very obvious that he'd been nowhere near any of the sightings that had taken place. And so he got slapped on the wrist, had a big fine, and was released. So we know that people were pretending to be spring Jack. They were cashing in on it, if you like, in some way, and the notoriety. Um, but it doesn't really quite add up. It doesn't, when you take all that away, if you take away the, you know, the very obvious um, confidence tricks or, or, or imitations, what you're left with is a hardcore story that represents this extraordinary figure, brilliant eyes, um, ability to leap far, uh, clawed hands, and of course, the famous spring heel boots. If they were spring heel boots, we don't know. Right. So it's there, isn't it? It's all there. And not surprisingly, in the in the fifties, when the great UFO boom happened, and everybody was attributing everything to aliens, um, I think it was John Keel who wrote an, a paper in which he said um, he must have been an alien because he's from a planet where the gravity is heavier than here, which is why he's able to leap over high fe- high fences and run at great speed. In other words, he was basically using the Superman argument. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of people believed that. And a lot of people started thinking that, that he was an alien, that he'd been left behind. You know, his spaceship had crashed or something like that. I'm not sure that that works for me, but a lot of people believed it, certainly. So they didn't actually see like a, a craft land and have somebody come out. They just kind of related him to a an odd UFO sighting? Is that how it went? Well, kind of. I mean, some of the descriptions of him, I mean, you, you've mentioned the most well-known ones, but there were also some where he was seen as wearing a, a kind of bulbous helmet mm. and a tight-fitting yellow suit. And so, of course, that immediately meant, you know, man from Mars to, to a lot of people <laughs> at the time. Um, so it, it all depends in which direction you take it. But in each case, the fast running, the high jumps... I mean, it is as recently as, um, let me think, was it uh, 19, 1986? Mm-hmm. Um, this happened in, in, in South Herefordshire. And there was a traveling salesman, and he was in his car driving along, probably doing 60 miles an hour because that's about the most you could do in those days. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was overtaken by a man running who ran past him and disappeared, leaping over a high hall, a high wall, rather. Um, and, uh, you know, immediately the man basically rang up the newspapers as soon as he got where he was going and described all this. And someone said, oh, spring your jack then. <laughs> so, you know, even then, that, that recent, again, people were, you only got to describe a character like this and they immediately assume it's the same one. Well, and I think it's interesting, too, that, that people calling all these sightings uh, him when, you know, all right, let's go back 50, 60 years, you would say, somebody say, oh, I just saw a ghost and everything. Oh, yeah, right. You sure did in your dreams, you know. And anybody that was uh, saying anything about ghosts, were kind of people were looking at them kind of strange. Well, now here we are, and they're extremely acceptable and believable now to a great deal of people. People don't make fun of people who say, hey, I just saw a ghost. You know, they're accepted. Yeah. And and but Jack's popularity now supersedes something that for many, many years, hundreds of years was so taboo and unbelievable. But yet Jack is believable. And I like that. I mean, do. 
I do, I do too. I like the fact that, that people, you know, as I said, they started out kind of being very questioning of it, but as time went by and more and more sightings were made and more and more of them were, were the same, mm-hmm. they started getting really worried. And this is when the vigilantes started showing up. And there was even a story that um, the Duke of Wellington, no less, um, who was in his 80s, came out of retirement and led a band of... Um, uh, vigilantes in search of Spring Hill Jack across the whole of London without ah. success. But if somebody of that importance regarded it as being necessary, you know, to go looking, then obviously they were worried. Mm-hmm. I lo- yeah, I I don't know how, you know, I'm thinking how if I was there and I knew that this character was leaping off the tall buildings and doing all this stuff, I don't really know how I would react to that. I, I suppose if I had the mindset of the time, I would probably be afraid. Um, I think in this day and age, if somebody said Spring Hill Jack was running around their neighborhood or something, I think the curiosity in people and the, the open-mindedness in people would be more intrigued than frightened. I especially think you're right. considering that he you know, didn't kill anybody. Well, yes, exactly. I mean, I'm sure people were and are curious about this. I mean, you know, the one I mentioned to you that happened in Baltimore, you know, in 1951, there was more curiosity there than fear. You know, they wanted to know who the nurses could be and where he was from and so on. But he was only seen over a period of some months and then never seen again, which suggests to me anyway that it was probably a real person, though it doesn't explain how he managed to leap up vertical walls and over buildings, according to those who saw him. So, you know, you have to keep an open mind with it all, really. Um, I mean, I'm sure there were definitely real people who were pretending to be this. And I think, mm-hmm. well, you have to remember also, that, that's, you know, you were, you were saying what was it like in Victorian London at the time. Well, first yeah. of all, there was very little street lighting. Yeah. Most of it was just, um, you know, you yeah. went or you took a torch or there was uh-huh. gas, which was really flickery. So it was quite difficult to see, and it was often quite dark, and this is why, of course, ladies did not go out on their own. They always went out in pairs or with a gentleman. Mm-hmm. Uh, but a couple of these things did happen to women. Well, one of them, uh, for instance, a lady called Lucy Scales, um, mm-hmm. was attacked in, in February 28, 1838. She was a serving girl, and she was literally going home. She, well, she didn't live in. She was going home to her home. And it was on her own, and she went down a narrow alley, and guess what? There's Spring Hill Jack. Mm-hmm. Um, and she got it. She got a bit more knocked about. I mean, she was mauled, I would yeah. say. She had scratches from the claws, and her clothes were torn. There was quite a lot of clothes tearing going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but nothing, nothing ever went any further than that, you know. I mean, but that would have made the women especially, I think, very frightened. Mm-hmm. Uh, so especially with there being so many actual murders and things going on at the time uh, you know not not we're not talking here about um jack the ripper yet but before that there were other uh, very unpleasant serial killers of course as there always have been so plenty of reasons to be afraid of this character even if as we say he never appears to have killed anybody well that's true and you know all these people that would dress up like him just to either wreak havoc or you know have a giggle um did actually keep his Jack's legend alive. And that isn't necessarily a bad thing if you have an open mind. I mean, there are people out there going, oh, my God, how did she just say that? That's a terrible thing to have them, you know, believing in, in this thing, in this creature, and it's not fun. But if you look at it from a lighthearted point of view, it kind of is, in a sense. Well, you know, aren't all the aren't all horror stories and all of these stories of creepy characters, you know, meant to not just frighten us but make us laugh as well? Mm-hmm. That seems mm-hmm. to be a reflex. You know, I've noticed this. You know, looking at, you know, many of the sort of well-known horror franchises of our time, um, especially the more modern ones. You know, there's a there's a comedy. There's a streak of comedy in there, and you'll often get if you sit in an audience with of people who have basically come there to be scared, you'll also hear them laughing. And they're laughing at, kind of to obviate the fear. Mm-hmm. So there's always that aspect of it as well. Well, if you take clowns, for example, some people laugh at clowns. Most people think they're great, but some people are deathly afraid of clowns. I am one of those. Well, I'm not deathly afraid, but I don't like them, certainly. Uh, I, I, and, yeah. 
I mean, one of the interesting things that I found when I was looking at this uh, is something that, as far as I know, no one's ever noticed, and it seemed to me so obvious I couldn't believe it, and that is the idea of the jack-in-the-box. Yes. Now, these are not around, of course, so much today, but most people still know what they are, and for children, they were a favorite toy, you know, from the 18th century onwards. Yeah. Well, I did a little bit of digging, and I found a, a pamphlet in a museum in Germany that specialized in collecting these. And it was full of photos, and all of them looked to me remarkably like the description of Spring Hill Jack. They had the horns sometimes, they had bulbous eyes, you know, they were very similar in some ways. And I'd like to mention that you do have pictures in the book of um, yes, indeed. There are one some... in particular that is ghastly looking. Uh, <laughs> you know, that would definitely yeah. scare. They were because they were originally made for, for adults, you see. They weren't mm -hmm. done as toys and they were actually made as, um, you know, to mock politicians. You know, they would, they would, we could do with some today, couldn't we? You know, they, well. they, they would, um, you know, <laughs> they'd make a caricature <laughs> of a certain person give them horns and claws and big eyes and then say, you know, that person is really a demon. So, yeah, you yeah. know, you wouldn't have to look too far to find a few of those around today. No, and I, you know, I never did know what the history of the Jack and, Jack in the Box was. I always thought it was a child's toy. And, and so now I'm going to look even deeper now that you mentioned that. Um, but there's one picture in here, which is of an ornate Jack in the Box. And um, the, the, pop-up guy it almost looks like a monk or or a king or i don't know what it is but it it's certainly not scary like the other one which looks like beelzebub himself uh, <laughs> it's just yes it's, um well, i suppose he, uh, you you're talking about the one um plate eight in the book for the yes, benefit of readers yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah he does have a, he has a slightly less less horrific character but he does have the little goat's horns he looks a bit more like Punch in a way. He and does, they, yes. And they were related, I think, to Punch as well, um, quite a bit. Uh, and again, because it's the trickster, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. wherever the trickster bit comes in, then there's, there's nearly always something about spring -heel Jack in there as well, somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and while you, you've mentioned Punch and Judy, there may be a lot of people who, in the States anyway, have heard the term but don't know what Punch and Judy were. Maybe this would be a good time for a little oh, sure. 101. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I mean, I don't know the detailed history of it. it as far as I know, it originated, first of all, um, in Italy uh, in the 18th century as, as, as a character in a little play. And mm -hmm. for some reason, it got, got blown up from that until it became the center of a whole series of stories all of which, by the way, are very horrific, very violent, uh, but they were also funny. And then they started gradually evolving into this idea that we still see a little of now today over here, that um, on the seafront particularly, uh, someone would come along and they'd have a little kind of booth that they would erect. Mm -hmm. And it would be like a little tiny theater with a curtain and everything. And they'd be behind it and they'd work these puppets. Yes. Yeah. And the main puppet, of course, is Punch, who is bad, wicked, um, beats everyone up, hits policemen over the head with his truncheon, um, <laughs> you know, beats up his wife, Judy, um, and um, speaks in this very strange nasal high-pitched voice, which I'm not even <laughs> going to try to imitate, don't worry. Thank you. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's become a kind of, it was a stereotype in a way after awesome. a while, and it came to stand for a kind of, you know, bad behavior, I suppose, um, you know, for people in the world who, who didn't care about the law and did whatever they wanted to do and were wild and tricksterish, tricksterish again, you see. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I definitely see aspects of Punch in, um, in, in Jack, most definitely. Yeah, I've, I've seen, like, I think people, if they're curious, can go on YouTube and find a Punch and Judy puppet show to, to get some idea of what they really they're, are. They're, they're great fun, you know. I mean, if it's, it's full of people going... Um, you know, being being hung or or chopped up into little pieces is very gory, in fact. <laughs> and 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 there's always Mr. Punch there in the middle, going, "That's the way to do it." You know, which is oh, his no. <laughs> <place>. <laughs> I'm going so, yeah, to have to watch some more. Pretty, pretty have a look. Do have a look, folks. Go on online and, and and Google Punch and Judy and see what there is. There's a whole history yeah. of it. I I might 
get around to investigating more sometime. It's fun. It, it is fun. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing about Spring Hill Jack was that he was a great scapegoat for perpetrators and violent things. And, and um, you know, he was he was a fall guy, so to speak. And, yeah. and that's probably another reason that he's been kept around for so long, because, you know, it's always like, I didn't do it. He did it. You know, I mean, that's. <laughs> mentality of a lot of people so oh, totally. he, it wasn't me it was springy and jack yes <laughs> yeah he served a variety of purposes i think um in people's imaginations um you know people that were interested in ufos people that um wanted to have some fun and could blame it on somebody else. i mean he he's like like the pivotal guy to go to he's the go-to guy to imitate and emulate um because he never fought back and said, hey, that wasn't me. <laughs> you know, it was just... No, that's the interesting thing, isn't it? You never get him writing a letter to the press saying, how dare you impersonate me. There you go. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, it's difficult, you know, like that. But, um, I mean, people were certainly wanted to know who it was. They wanted it to be a real person and they wanted to identify him. Mm -hmm. um, the, most, the, the most successful one um, was a chap called Henry de la Poa. He was the third Marquis of Waterford. Um, he, this is an actual historical character from the 19th century, a nobleman um, who had a reputation for being a trickster, who also had rather staring eyes and a maniacal laugh. Mm -hmm. Now, this was enough to persuade some people that he was spring -heel Jack, that it was he who was, you know, dressing up and, and just playing pranks on people because he liked to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously I looked at this very carefully in the book and I don't feel that there is enough evidence partly because he simply wasn't in, able to be in 16 places at once yeah. which yeah. he'd have had to be in order to be all of these um, so you know there's there's probably an aspect of that personage um, again both in some of the other people who dressed up and in, pretended to be Jack in people who believed that he was a real person and then, of course, there's the other camp who went, no, he wasn't a real person. He was a ghost. He was a demon. You know, every, everybody had their own opinion. Yeah. And, and you know, there's going to no two people going to agree on this because there's so much variety and so many different aspects. Yeah. But all right. So this also kind of interested me. Um, why do you think the worldwide steampunk community has so thoroughly embraced Jack? I think that has a lot to do with the costume, to be honest. Um, okay. You'll notice that in the in, in the book, one of the plates is it shows him as a steampunk character. In fact, he was it's from my steampunk tarot that I did, mm -hmm. um, and um, I think you've got it there. You know, you've got the character with the you know with the strange shaped helmet, the goggles for the staring eyes, um, also the idea of. Um, uh, perhaps wearing a tank on his back, which enabled him to apparently spit blue fire. Mm -hmm. There are quite a lot of sort of what you what you might call Victorian uh, technical explanations for it. Um, and because the steampunk movement is um, basically comes out of the uh, the Victorian um, inventiveness, if you like, their their their, their love of curious inventions. Um, you know, because the steampunk thing takes the Victorian idea and then puts uh, technology into it that it didn't really have. So I think if you bring those two things together, then you have a perfect frame uh, for Spring Hill Jack. Yeah, that makes sense. I just, I, I guess I'm still amazed at how he has managed to stay so relevant um, in time. Because look, you wrote a book. We're talking about this now. Now there's going to be tons of people listening to the show that have never heard of him and now they're going to get curious about him and it just keeps the I don't know I don't know if I call it a legend or um, it, it just keeps Jack's name out there and I think this is probably going to go on till the end of time wouldn't right? surprise me you know I'm new stuff comes up all the time and um, you know I mean if I do a revised edition later on i'm certainly going to be able to take it back probably about 100 years earlier wow yeah. it's very much sightings that we've we've come across now and i'm sure there'll be new ones you know i mean there's no doubt that you know when you get a perfectly ordinary family on their way home and you spot something weird and decide to tell the newspaper that they've seen spring hill jack 
you know that it's still very much around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some, some legends you... never die, kind of. Um, Hopefully lots of people who didn't know about Spring Hill Jack will now go and buy my book. Plug, plug. <laughs> yes, yes. Shamefully plugging. I love that. Because um, I do the same thing. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, there there has been tons of research that you've done. Mm. I mean, the book is full of old newspaper articles, the court trials, um, you know, dating back to the 1800s. It's a fascinating read. Um how long did it take you to, to write this book? Because there's so much there. Well, the actual writing didn't take that long. The re research took a couple of years altogether. Yeah, yeah. And some of it went back further because I was always interested in this. And I'd, I keep a file, you know, things that, are, that might possibly be of interest to do more research on. Um, but I must pay tribute to um, Mike Astley, who, who went before me, as it were, into this and compiled a lot of the information which I was fortunately able to draw upon. I mean, I, I was busy, you know, going around the newspaper libraries in London and, and copying all these things out. And I discovered that he'd already done some of them, which mm. took me a lot of time. Um, yeah. And he's the one who's found the, um, you know, the work, uh, this earlier material now. So there are a lot of people out there, well, several people out there anyway, uh, in the research area who are still looking into this and new materials coming to light all the time. So we haven't heard the end of the story yet. No, and everybody loves a good mystery. And, uh, you know, some mysteries will never be solved. I mean, that's just the nature of things, but that doesn't mean that people aren't going to keep trying to figure it out. And, um, all right, so chapter six in the book is entitled, Who Was Jack? Right. So, as you mentioned earlier, you have formed some kind of conclusion, um, in your mind, so what do you think? Who was he? Was he man? Was he beastie? Um, was he actually somebody or just some figment of circumstance? Oh, I'm absolutely sure he wasn't a figment. Um, you know, all the evidence points to the fact that there was at least one, if not two or three, real people who were involved in this. And how they achieved it, well, I mean, there are some suggestions in the book about various... Um, you know, magic tricks that were that could be learned from conjurers of the time that would have given the illusion of someone able to jump through the air, even though, in fact, they weren't doing so. Mm -hmm. So it's not impossible that someone with a, some ingenuity, a knowledge of magic, a knowledge of uh, conjuring magic, that is, mm -hmm. uh, a knowledge of, of uh, and, and the ability to make a mask, um, you know, the costume, basically, um, could have done this. And I think there are two or three. But more important than that, my what I really feel is the origin of all this is this very ancient, um, very deep atavistic belief in the mystery of the trickster, the, the the desire to explain why things work the way they do in the world, which is where you get the green man and the fairy beings coming in as well. Um, you know, you've only got to look at the story of Robin Goodfellow, for instance, who's one of the very famous fairies, mm -hmm. uh, who again is running around. Um, playing tricks on people, leaping over hedges, laughing hysterically, mm -hmm. uh, and playing all kinds of tricks. So, I mean, it, you don't have to look very hard at that one to see, well, there's another aspect of this. Uh, it doesn't mean yeah. that it's the same. It's just that easy influence is there. Well, it makes sense. And, you know, fairies are tricksters. Let's talk about Puck from Midsummer Night's Dream. He was, he was a trickster. Um, Tinkerbell from Peter Pan. She was a little trickster. Yeah. Um, they're in a history throughout history. They have such things. Um, I mean, people all know this and it goes back to the devil who is the original trickster. Is he not? <laughs> if you know, you believe, well, the he's one of them. I mean, he's one of them. I don't know about original because of course, for most people who study most common. history, he is later than any of the others. You know, I mean, he's well, true. Later than the green man, but you know, you know that. Um, I do, but, yes. <laughs> not <laughs> everyone would agree with us, of course, but um, it depends on, on what you believe, really. I mean, um, certainly some of the portrayals, as you said, you know, and there are many more that I wasn't able to include in the book, that you see the pictures that are very clearly based on, on the devil. Um, and I think for a lot of people, as far as they were concerned, he was. It was old Nick making an appearance. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, uh, you know, so there's, there are all these aspects. There are folklore beliefs, ancient traditions, um, and then later on, you know, the newer versions of those things in ufology and aliens. Um, so you really, he's a composite. That, that's my, that's where I, the bottom line for me. Spring Hill Jack, as we understand him today, is a composite. And I do think there was at least one person, if not more, who was dressing the part and had found ways to, uh, to, to jump high places or appear to jump high places. Um, and that this uh, invoked in people's minds uh, older traditions, fairies, green men, whatever, mm-hmm. demons, mm-hmm. devils, that just, you know, many of whom were called Jack. So, you know, it, it just seemed to fit together. Yeah, and, and I like the Jack reference, that the Jack name itself has some meaning in in that whole area. Um, and if people look at the, the book cover, um, just looking at him, he's very compelling, actually. Uh, <laughs> you know? It's a great cover, isn't it? I love it. I must say, I'm very pleased with it. Yeah, it was a very lovely thing to find because you know how publishers are. Sometimes they find their own covers. Um, yeah, always want to have. I mean, I I really did want to have the steampunk one on the on the cover on the front because for mm-hmm. me that is one of the best representations that I've seen in, in modern times. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I guess they didn't want it to be too steampunk. You know. Yeah. So no. Uh, so they went for something more traditional. I mean, it's a little touch of Dracula there, maybe. A bit of uh, Jekyll and Hyde. I mean, there's a yes. few things, definitely, but but it's still Jack, you know. So there you are, mysterious. I, I think this year people will be dressing up like Jack for Halloween. Now that would be something I would love to see. I really well, would. You okay, see, guys. Anybody? That? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anybody that's listening to the show, if you're going to dress up as Spring Hill Jack for Halloween. Please get in touch with me, send pictures, and I will get them to John. Thank yes. You Good enough. I'll try and put them in the next edition. Or at least one <laughs> of them. Right. I'd, I'd love to see those. I'd love to see them. Yeah. All right. So now that we've talked so much about the book, it might be a good idea to let people know where they can find it. Oh, sure. Well, I mean, you know, the usual places, as they say, Amazon, <laughs> online, um, in all good bookstores. That's what we used to say, wasn't it? Uh-huh. <laughs> it's and probably even, yeah. Destiny books, um, and uh, it's it's out there right now. And I can't tell you how much it is. Oh yes, I can. It is nineteen ninety five dollars. Um, ah, for there. worth every penny of it. Um, of pictures, but, lots of stuff, maps, stories, yes. the works. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. There's some beautiful illustrations. There's some beautiful color illustrations. There's some black and white illustrations. The, the newspaper articles alone are well worth reading the book. So, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and I'm going to go over it again because um, I might have missed something here and there as we go. Um, also, where can people find out about you? Is there a website, social media? Uh, sure, where can well, I'm, people... I'm on Facebook. I'm on Facebook as, as myself, as is my wife, Kathleen. We, we do a lot of work together. We teach shamanism. We do courses of various kinds around the world. Um, and we've written a great between us. We've written nearly 200 books. Um, <laughs> we're busy. Um, yeah. And we have a website of our own, which is HelloQuest. That's one word, H-A-L-L-O-W-Q-U-E-S-T dot org dot UK. And there you'll find a list of the books. You can buy the books there, um, and you'll see, see all about our courses and the other work we're involved with. So that's where you can find out about us. Oh, so you're doing courses too? I didn't, I didn't get that far. That what kind of courses do you offer? Well, we both teach shamanism, uh, right. traditional British, native, Celtic, I suppose, to some extent. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Um, we also teach mythology in wide, wide range of things. Um, I've taught stuff on the fairies. Um, we have a very wide range, actually, and we do yeah. we do courses which are open to everyone, and we also do a big kind of showcase every year in December. We do a kind of pre-Christmas special um, in a place called Hawkwood College at Stroud in Gloucestershire, and uh, mm-hmm. there's always something interesting there. We've done Robin Hood. We've done King Arthur. Obviously, I do a lot on King Arthur because that's my main interest. Yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we, we, we are... 
we are, you know, always busy with something. That's always a good thing. And uh, I really do want to thank you so much for writing such an interesting book and for coming and sharing it with us. And I've also had a look at some of your other books. And I'm kind of thinking that we're going to need to have you back, if you don't mind, to maybe talk about some of the other books. If sure, I'd be glad to, anytime, absolutely. And thank you for your kind words, Marla, about, the, about this one. Oh, uh, absolutely. Always happy to talk about King Arthur and the Grail. I'm doing a book on the Grail at the moment, which has got some new stuff in it. Um, wow. And I'm doing a whole book on Arthurian shields, on the kind of arms that were carried by Arthurian knights. Oh, wow. So, interesting stuff. <laughs> yeah, you might have to come back maybe two or three times in the future, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> well, once again, thank you so much for being here. And I also want to thank everybody for listening in as well. Because, as I always say, if you guys weren't around, I'd be talking to myself. And I do enough of that on my own, so good that I have a real audience. <laughs> So until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. Nice. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at this same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2014. Moonlight Hall by Kevin McLeod. Licensed through Incompetech.com. 